I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'm speaking with Professor Audrey Allstadt. She is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a leading expert on Azerbaijan. Hello, Professor Allstadt. Welcome to UATV. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. I want to ask you, how would you describe the current political situation in Azerbaijan? At present, it seems as if the political situation in Azerbaijan has become much more constricted. I've been watching this pattern really since the winter of 2013-14, in other words, since the last presidential election. And the way I would characterize this, uh, and I'm certainly not alone in this, is that um, both laws and practices have made it more difficult for NGOs to operate, uh, for journalists to function in any sort of normal fashion. And um, all of the recent reports, in fact, all reports on um, election process have been um, negative, meaning that they were judged by outside um, observers not to have met uh, appropriate international standards of free and fair elections. This problem with elections has been um, true since 1993, but this limitation on public um, protests, public discourse, the work of journalists, this has become increasingly, um, increasingly strict, space has become increasingly restrictive. Uh, and just in the last week, there have been arrests, even an arrest of a journalist uh, an Azerbaijani journalist in Georgia, and the mechanism by which he was arrested and found himself suddenly in Azerbaijan, that has not even been cleared up. How popular is the president, especially with what's happened with the economy in recent years? That's really very difficult to say. I was working on a project over this last week and trying to update some of the material that I had discovered over um, the last few years. And when I went to some of the places like um, Caucasus Barometer, uh, that used to have fairly well updated opinion polls, uh, or the German Marshall Fund, I discovered that there were not updates for 2015 as there were for the neighboring countries of Georgia and Armenia. And so it's become more difficult even to have public opinion polls. From the last polls that, that are available, it seems as if President Aliyev is pretty popular. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, Azerbaijanis tend to think that they shouldn't mix in politics. Uh, and therefore, they don't want to talk to outsiders about their political views. Another issue bearing on this directly is that there's a very strong tradition going back not only to the Soviet period, but even before that, that a president should be a very strong individual. And as long as Aliyev presents himself as being strong uh, and he is in command of um, resources and military and armed force, then he'll probably be perceived as strong. A third factor is that there have been very small steps made that actually assist the lives of regular people. Several years ago, a number of um, state licensing processes, tax payments, and so on, were put online. Uh, the system is called the ASAN system. And it got very high marks from the average person because it meant that instead of having to go to some office, stand in line, and maybe pay a bribe in order to get, let's say, a driver's license or to pay taxes, they could, in fact, do this all online, and it made things simpler and ultimately cheaper for them. Um, but it is really in terms of uh, political, politically active groups uh, as I said, the media and so on, that there has been much harsher treatment. Um, there's also, there seems also to be a big urban-rural difference. Rural people are much less aware of some of the political problems in Baku because Baku is where everybody in fact is. They're much more aware of, of local problems. And 
as was true in the Soviet period, they tend to blame local officials rather than the central government. So if there were opinion polls, and if it turned out that Ilham Aliyev was still quite popular, I would not be surprised. Is the president, is he solidifying his family's power? We see his wife as president, or vice president, excuse me. The Constitution isn't altered to lower the age of the presidency, perhaps for his son? You've pointed out here two very obvious steps that um, Ilham Aliyev and the circle around him, the governing elites, uh, have taken recently in order to bolster his power. You can even look back a little bit further. Um, the fact that um, in early 2011, the legislative body, body the Milli Majlis, which is the National Assembly, uh, sort of the equivalent of a parliament, but I don't like that term because it makes us think about the British parliament, and it's really nothing like that at all. The National Assembly did eliminate term limits, and that allowed Ilham Aliyev, who's quite young, he's only in his 50s now even, um, to continue to expect one re-election after another. So that was really one of the early steps in altering the laws of the country in order to um, to consolidate his power through law. And the only reason that was possible was that in turn in the fall of 2010, the elections to the National Assembly eliminated all of the major political parties. You'll see parties other than the ruling party, which is the Yeni Azerbaijan Party or YAP, um, but many of those independent parties are in fact pro-YAP and pro-regime. So they're not real opposition parties, although they say that they are. So that was an early step. And then this constitutional referendum that took place last summer that was really rushed through um, also added, as you pointed out, um, other means by which the Aliyev family as a whole could consolidate its power uh, and the ability of the president to appoint a first vice president was one of those. And that's why he was able to, in fact, appoint his wife as first vice president. And lowering the age for um, presidency could, of course, be an opportunity to appoint their young son, Haydar. Um, I think it's a safety net. Um, as far as we can all determine, there is no reason to think that Ilham Aliyev cannot continue for health reasons to remain as president for decades. Um, and so I think that it's sort of a safety net. It's sort of a, of a just-in-case kind of move. But indeed, it is part of a, a consolidation of power in the political realm. If you wanted to look also at the economic realm and look at the extensive family holdings in key areas of the economy, that would also be a contributing factor as well. I wanted to ask you, you know, we're in Ukraine. There's an ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. How does Azerbaijan's ongoing conflict with Armenia relate to the development of a healthy political culture and civil society? The existence of these kinds of conflicts, whether you look at the one in the Caucasus or several in the Caucasus, the one with Azerbaijan in mountainous Karabakh, or those in Georgia, um, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and so on, these are all profoundly destabilizing to civil society. And from what I read, I believe you're seeing the same thing also in Ukraine. It's obviously frightening to the average person, potentially destabilizing to ruling elites to be in this situation. How can they possibly tell what might come up when there might be an upsurge of violence? Um, how people in civil society might be divided in terms of the issues that are involved here. Some of the studies that deal specifically with Azerbaijan and Armenia um, have, have argued that the problem is not that outside mediators have not imposed peace. I think if we look at worldwide conflicts, you can see that it's impossible for outside mediators to do that. The parties involved have to be willing and they have to negotiate and they have to prepare their own populations to make compromises which are always going to be necessary in order to come to peace. Uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia have not been doing that. It's been rather convenient for both governments to be able to say that they cannot 
and they act domestic reforms because they're in a state of war, because they have to be so careful. They have to make sure that there's not too much public criticism in order to uh, quash um, factions which may lead to instability. And so it makes it very difficult then uh, with that kind of a, a framework uh, and context to be able to really establish um, more stable civil society and to institute reforms. Does, with regard to the economy, does, is Azerbaijan doing anything to um, broaden, diversify its economy, uh, so, not solely based on oil? Contrary to some of the things that Ilham Aliyev said uh, the last two or, or even three years when he goes to the international uh, meeting at Davos, Switzerland, there hasn't been obvi any obvious sign of actual economic diversification within the country. Um, you can see uh, through, for example, the devaluation of the currency three times uh, in the last um, year and a half or so, that the drop in oil prices has really been damaging to Azerbaijan's economy. Um, but the kind of diversification which has been discussed but really not acted on, would be, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the kind of diversification that might lead to a resurgence of some of the local manufacturing and even agriculture that was um, in existence even though at a low level during the Soviet period. So local clothing and, and shoe manufacturing, these kinds of things, which would benefit the local population. But there have been recent um, discussions about expanding international trade. And one that I've really been paying attention to over the last six months is the expansion of a north-south trade corridor linking Iran's rail system to Russia's rail system through Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan is really the only country that can reasonably do that because it's the only country that borders both Iran and Russia. And what will happen, and that rail link is expected to be completed by the end of 2017. So when that additional transit trade comes through, there will be lots of money uh, that will be able to come in, which the government will control. And it will then be able to stabilize currency and do other things at the ruling level. And yet at the same time, they'll still control the spigot, so to speak, that allows that money or stops that money from trickling down to the rest of the population. And so then the ruling elites can determine exactly how much money they can allow and, and use it to establish peace within society and gain more support for the regime without actually seriously improving um, people's standard of living within Azerbaijan itself. My final question, I want to ask you, this is a very broad and general question, but where do you see the future of Azer Azerbaijan going in the next five, 10 years, economically, politically, with related uh, Know, the media. I'm sorry to say that I don't see Azerbaijan on a very positive trajectory over the next five years, uh, or even six, seven, ten is a little too hard to, to determine. But um, I've been, uh, although I'm a historian, and, and normally I study the 19th and, and earlier parts of the 20th centuries, over the last couple of years, I've been really studying the post-Soviet period in addition. Um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll plug my new book. It's called Frustrated Democracy in Post-Soviet Azerbaijan. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, because of that, I've paid a great deal of attention to the economic, political, social trends within the country. And the things that might improve life for the average Azerbaijani, things like uh, diversification of the economy, the creation of jobs for people who don't speak a foreign language and are not connected to the energy sector or to banking, which means the majority of the population. Um, those kinds of changes are not being made. Uh, housing that is affordable for most of the population as opposed to high-end luxury housing, those things are not being built. Much more effort, more investment is being put into things that enhance 
uh, tourism and um, luxury housing and hotels and resorts and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that immediately is going to be a huge disadvantage for the, the, the average person. Also, the limitation on, uh, on the media. Just in the last month, five um, news sources that are based abroad, uh, including Naidan TV, which is run by Azerbaijanis, uh, have been blocked uh, on the Internet from broadcasting into Azerbaijan. So the space for media uh, has also been constrained. The opportunity to run for office so that people, even at the local level, could become participants in changes that, that might benefit them at the local level. These things are also really very limited. Um, so I'm not seeing any of the factors within the country that might lead to a better life, to more reform, to more democratic processes inside of Azerbaijan. And I am not seeing very much pressure either from the outside, from Western organizations uh, or from the United States. Um, you know, that's a separate topic, of course, um, what Western countries can do and whether they're willing to attempt to uh, exert themselves. But whether they are or not, the willingness would have to come domestically from the Azerbaijani ruling class, and that is what I am sadly not seeing. Well, actually, my very last question, I really wanted to touch on that. Why aren't the United States, EU, doing more to um, become involved to put pressure on the presidential regime in Azerbaijan? There are two, two different trends, I would say, in terms of Azerbaijan's relationship with the United States and with Europe. Um, and this is, of course, a very big topic, so I'm going to summarize here. Uh, one of them is that Azerbaijan has been a really valuable partner uh, for the United States, certainly, for uh, Western partners in terms of supplying oil and natural gas, in terms of assisting in the war on terror, which was declared by the United States uh, after the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States, and also in terms of um, military assistance uh, in the form really of landing rights, allowing the U.S. to be able to uh, land and resupply in order to move along, uh, get forces and, and supplies and so on to Afghanistan. Um, and in those respects, Azerbaijan has been a good partner. Azerbaijan also has been very open to foreign investment, which it welcomes. And it uh, touts itself as having a favorable business climate. Uh, Western organizations have had uh, mixed responses to that presentation sort of depends on where you look to see whether it is a good partner or not. The lack of transparency in a lot of areas of investment and banking uh, give it lower marks than it might otherwise. On the other hand, and, and, and those things, this issue about security and energy, these constitute two of the three legs of the so-called triad that have determined U.S. policy toward Azerbaijan ever since independence. The third leg of that triad is democracy slash human rights. And um, many, many times in U.S.-Azerbaijani relations, that triad uh, has in fact weighed more heavily on the importance of energy and military or strategic support rather than the uh, pressure for, for human rights. There have been some U.S. administrations and there have been some U.S. ambassadors who have stressed the importance of human rights and democratic process more than others. But um, overall, when that has happened, the Azerbaijani government has realized it just had to wait, and it could wait out those ambassadors who were more attentive to human rights and so on, uh, and that, that that would probably pass. Uh, on the European side, the Europeans have also benefited, and they hope in the future to benefit more from natural gas coming from Azerbaijan. And so there's a whole issue of, of gas pipeline construction that has to be taken into account in this regard. But for instance, the Council of Europe initially was quite critical of Azerbaijan and did indeed pressure it. Uh, and in spite of countless resolutions and critical reports, Azerbaijan simply said, you're, in, you're interfering in our internal affairs. 
And you also don't understand what it means to be sitting here in between Iran on the one side and a potentially uh, disruptive, um, radical Sunni uh, Chechnya and the rest of the Caucasus region on our north. And we really need to maintain stability. And this is something that you can't understand. And therefore, you really need to stop interfering in our internal affairs. Um, this has been really amplified over the last several years by um, a process that the European Stability Initiative has identified as caviar diplomacy. And this is a way in which Azerbaijan has really very deliberately courted individual Council of Europe representatives in order to um, provide them with gifts, uh, sometimes uh, trips to Azerbaijan, all of these sorts of things, in order to persuade them that it's really quite a good partner and they shouldn't worry about the human rights issues because they're very minor. And so gradually, if you look at some of the European organizations, some of them are very firm about wanting to maintain um, the pressure to democratize and to observe human rights and to free the media. Um, but others have become divided between those who think that they're being too harsh toward Azerbaijan and that Azerbaijan needs support and that it will ultimately develop over time, undetermined amount of time, uh, toward greater democratization. Well, and so, in fact, to look at this problem, it, you, you're really getting into a lot of, of contradictory points of view and different parties who have different reasons to either go easy on Azerbaijan or to criticize it and hold it up to a Western standard of democracy and human rights. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Allstadt. Very informative, very fascinating. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. I was speaking with Professor Audrey Allstadt. She is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and a leading expert on Azerbaijan. You've been watching UATV.